So my name is Alex Boyer. I um, came to Rye in 98. My sister was taking classes here in Los Angeles, um, Rye Parent Infant Classes, and she gave me the book, Your Self-Confident Baby, when my daughter turned six months old, mm -hmm. and I loved that book so much um, that I read it and I used all of the methods at home, and then when my daughter turned, my youngest one turned two, I came to Los Angeles for the Rye One training, and um, I'm a Rye associate now, and because of the whole interest in an early childhood development, I ended up going back to school, and I got an associate's degree in early childhood, and then a um, bachelor's in public health, and my introduction um, 15 years ago really started a whole new direction for me, and I appreciate everything that they've done. Today we're gonna talk about tummy time, but before I do, I wanna just get a feeling for um, how familiar you are with the work of Rye and Magda Gerber first. So um, will you raise your hand if anyone in here is either a Rye associate or if you've taken Rye 1 or if you do parent-infant classes? Okay, all right. And is there anybody that's here at this conference for the first time? Okay. And um, anyone that's read Your Self-Confident Baby? Okay. What about people that work with infants? Okay, awesome. Toddlers? Okay. Um, does anybody teach parent-infant classes? Okay. And does anybody work in an early education or a child care center? Okay, all right. And how old are the babies that you work with? For those of you that work with infants, what are the youngest children in your care? Six weeks. Six, six weeks? And you guys? Two months? Um, the right after the hospital? Um, oh, okay, awesome, great. Okay, good. So in the last two decades, um, the recommendation to place infants onto their bellies for what we call tummy time um, has become what I think of as a universal recommendation. A universal recommendation um, would be something like car seats for babies. You know, for those of us born a while ago, it was optional, it was better, but not necessary, and then became strongly recommended, and now it's the law. So it's something that we do really to protect the health and safety of children. And tummy time has become something like that. It's really seldom questioned, and new mothers get the recommendation to place their baby in tummy time from a variety of practitioners, including their doctors, nurses, community educators. Um, babies used to be placed on their bellies to sleep. It was very common. The main reason for that was they sleep better on their bellies. As many tired moms will tell you, um, a lot of babies are quieted better when they're put to sleep on their bellies. That's why people do it. Um, now, in the 1990s, they started the Back to Sleep campaign. It was very, very successful. And now they estimate that about 85% of all babies are placed on their backs to sleep. So we really completely changed and turned around the way that people put their babies to sleep. The success of the Back to Sleep campaign, a lot of people attribute to the fact that the education really came from a broad spectrum of uh, authorities, if you will. So we had pediatricians, we had neonatal nurses, who are very important because they're talking to moms when they're in the hospitals. It's a very vulnerable time right after you've given birth, and you're very open to educational messages. So they're getting that there. They're getting it from um, reading materials and radio and television. So it was a really widespread campaign. And the change has been in the last decade. Um, so they used to, with, tum with um, the back to sleep, the re recommendation was back to sleep and tummy to play. So you put your babies on their back to sleep and then when they're awake, you give them some time on their tummy. And that's changed in the last 10 years too from infants to newborns. So that's something new. And you'll hear recommendations in the hospital for actually placing newborns on their bellies. And um, we're gonna call it tummy time for our sake but you'll find documentation or research on it. They call it prone positioning, which basically implies that you're positioning the babies in the prone or downwards position. So the first thing I wanna look at is what are we talking about and what does it look like 
for the babies. So the Back to Sleep campaign was aimed at reducing the incidence of SIDS, or SUID, which we call it now, sudden unexplained infant death. As the research was being published, they found that there were several factors that parents could control to reduce the risk. So one of those was smoking in the household. Another one was preventing babies from overheating, um, having them sleep on their backs or sides. Those were all things, um, and soft beddings or toys in the crib. So those were all things that they felt they could educate parents to control for those factors, and they did. About a decade later, what they discovered when they looked at the number of infant deaths with babies that were on their back and the ones that were side was that the evidence pointed to back only. And so now you'll see parents being sent home with their babies with the message to just back to sleep. So there's a reason they don't say side anymore. And that was the research really showed that there was a further reduction in that. So the question is, why is the back to sleep protective. It's, it's very warm in here. I'll talk to you. <laughs> so what is it about the back sleeping position that's so protective? Um, the interesting thing is that they're not really, really sure, but some evidence points to some um, factors that could be more important than others. So one of them is that the newborn baby's ribs, their rib cage is shaped differently than ours are. Their rib cage tends to be a little bit boxier if you've worked with babies. You know, ours point down, but theirs seem to protrude more for them. And when the babies are born, you know, they've never used their lungs before. So there's that sort of, especially if you're having a vaginal birth, a baby that goes through the birth canal is really squeezed. And then as they're released, their, their ribs sort of spring back and they expand and that causes that <gasps> sharp intake of breath that really fills the lungs up. And then because their muscles are still weak, they'll sort of suck the lungs back down again. So it's really difficult for babies, but it's mastered very quickly how to hold the breath so that you can breathe. It's part of their adjustment. What they have found in research is that it is a somewhat gradual process and that the babies will, through reflexes, hold the air in to actually fill lungs up and strengthen them so that they're able to breathe better. And so what they'll see with newborn babies is they'll breathe in and then they'll hold and then they'll exhale. So you, some of the newborn reflexes help them to do that. So if that's what they're working on, it makes a lot of sense to think then if you take somebody who's just gradually expanding and learning how to do that and whose muscles are not strong yet, that if you place them on their bellies, that whole system is going to be compressed. So breathing really is easier for the newborn babies on their back. Another thing that is, happens when the babies are on their back is their moral or their startle reflex isn't suppressed and so it's more active. And you can see that with babies when you take a newborn and you pick them up or you move them quickly or even when they're laying on their backs, they'll startle like that. The startle reflex is pretty much always accompanied again with, a, with an intake of air, so it's <laughs> that. And so that, again, is a reflex, but it's protective because it forces baby to take the air in again. Now, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Oh. So when we're talking about sleep mm -hmm. and the moral reflex, mm -hmm. what, are, what are your um, opinions on swaddles? Well, it's very, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. So, because it all ties together, right? You really don't want babies to be in a very, very deep sleep. And there's two reasons why they feel that breastfeeding is protective. One of them is when breastfed babies are lying with their mothers, there's that constant stimulation of having the breast and the scent of the milk there. And so they feel the breastfed, the mother baby dyad never falls in as deep of a sleep as a baby that's formula fed. So for us as parents, we think, well, that's terrible because I want my baby to sleep. But it's actually protective because you don't want babies falling into that super deep sleep. And the other factor that comes into it is because of the moral reflex, they'll be sleeping. And even in sleep, they'll startle. And the startle, again, <gasps> causes that sharp intake of breath. And what they think happens is, with a prone position, it's the same as a swaddle. You're containing the baby. You're suppressing the moral reflex. So it can't happen. And because of that, you lose 
the gas, but you also get a much better sleeping baby. <laughs> and so it's sort of a, a circle in a way. So you have your baby on their bellies, they can't startle, they go into a deeper sleep, and that's where they think that the sudden infant death can happen. So, um, so yes, the baby will sleep less because the startle reflex will awaken them. Um, and another thing is when a baby is in the prone position, that the carbon dioxide levels around their face, they believe that it tends to pool there, and that's another reason. So the baby takes in the oxygen, and then they're breathing out CO2, and then you have blankets and maybe some stuffed animals there, and maybe baby is dressed really warmly, and maybe you have a comforter there, and they think that with some babies that are maybe more vulnerable than others, that those levels go up, and that may also lead to SIDS. So again, you put the baby on their backs, and you completely avoid that situation, right? So with every good thing, <laughs> there's always consequences, right? So they, did the, they started the Back to Sleep campaign. The reduction of SIDS happened, so that was very successful. And then research decided to look at what are the consequences for all of these babies now being put to sleep on their backs. There's two main directions in the research. One of them, and this is what professionals are telling your parents are the reasons why they're recommending tummy time. So the first one is deformational plagiocephaly, and we're just gonna call that DP, but it's also flat head. So any flattening of the skull, whether it happens in utero or afterwards, that's what it's called. We'll just call it DP for short today. So they looked at and believed that this is a consequence of the back to sleep campaign. And the other one is delayed motor development. So the theory is that babies spend all of their time asleep on their backs, that they will develop physically, their gross motor will develop more slowly than babies that are placed in tummy time. And these two ideas are so well established that they're really not questioned anymore. It's very, very common for doctors, all the important people, doctors, neonatal nurses, community educators, um, this is the recommendation across the board, is tummy time so that you avoid the DP and that your baby's development will not be delayed. So my question when I originally wrote this paper, I really wanted to examine this issue. I've had my RIE training, so I felt really strongly about it, but I wanted to have some actual research papers on my side. So my question was, does research show that healthy term babies, so full term babies without medical problems, need to be placed on their bellies while they're awake to attain their milestones? And can you avoid DP by placing babies on their bellies when they're awake. So just to see what's the research out there and does it prove that if parents put their babies on their bellies when they're awake, that their, their motor development will somehow excel or it won't be delayed and that you can avoid having a flathead by placing your babies to play on their belly because that's the arguments that are out there. So one thing that I did notice is unless you're in our field, nobody seems to care about this very much. I had many people ask me, you know, where are you going? What are you presenting? And I'd be like, tummy time. And they were just like, what's the big deal? Seriously, like you do it with newborns. It's done in a couple of months. Why should we care about something like this? And most people really consider this like harmless at most. Like the most you can say about tummy time is that it probably doesn't do any harm. So why not do it? That's really the attitude for the most part. And a lot of times, if you go to your practitioner and you say to them, well, what would happen if I didn't? A lot of times they'll say, well, probably nothing, but you may as well. So why look at this? <laughs> so I want to give you a quote um, from a German researcher. And I'm going to, I have a lot of citations in this, but you, Rai is going to, um, I'm hoping they'll post it as a PDF online. So if any of you are interested in that, you should be able to go online and get it. And I'll have the, the authors and the publication date and all of that for you. So um, Marx and Strasberg say, 
when we intervene in the natural course of development of an infant, so intervening would be putting them to an, into a position that they can't get into on their own, basically moving ahead with them. We take away one of the major venues that the very young child has for actualization, competence, and self-initiated interaction with the environment. So we're taking away the baby's opportunity to be active in the environment and actually feel good that they're able to do something on their own. So we're taking that away by teaching them something that they could be doing on their own when they're ready. And not only that, but what I'd like to introduce to you to here today is not only are we doing that, but we're stimulating what they call primitive, primitive newborn reflexes. And these particular reflexes have a purpose, but this purpose is stimulated during tummy, tummy time, but it isn't fulfilled. And I'll show you some videos at the end that will show you the actual natural reason that babies react the way that these babies did when they were on their bellies. So the first thing I want to talk about is gross motor development. So we're going to look at, is this really, does the back to sleep campaign really has a delayed development, and can you really speed it up by placing babies in tummy time? So the first thing is to look at decades of research that show that infant development, motor development, follows a predictable trajectory. And that trajectory crosses all socioeconomic, cultural, and national boundaries. And if you've ever seen, I think it's Seeing Infants with New Eyes, Magda Gerber talks about if babies really needed us to teach them how to roll over, to sit, to walk, to lay on their sides, if they really needed us to educate them, the world would be divided into two places. And it would be the one side where you have all the babies that can move really well because their parents were educated and took them to classes and taught them to. And then you'd have the other part of the world where they couldn't do anything because nobody ever taught them anything. And we know that that's not true. We know that across the world, all babies grow and develop in good environments very well, and they learn to go through all of the steps on their own. We um, also feel, you saw these babies on their bellies, that when a baby is placed, a newborn is placed on their backs, that that position gives that baby the most free movement, so they can move their heads, they can move their arms, they can move their legs, and then we kind of look at that as the starting point for everything else that comes after it. So when I talk about a natural progression, in my mind I see a baby that's being put on their backs, and that then bit by bit will add all the other movements onto it. So when I think of that, my starting movement is on the back. So in the first six months, the main motor development, or baby's main job in the first six months, is to learn to be on their backs, to move their eyes, their heads, their arms and their legs, and their bodies, roll onto their sides, stabilize on the side. And you'll see babies that will put their little leg out and their arms, and they'll learn to reach. But they're not able to roll over yet. They're not ready, and they'll go back to their back. So that's a real stage. Then onto their, onto their bellies, and then back onto their backs. So that really is their main job for the first six months. Baby, in this time period, baby needs and wants to test. They want to learn. They want to struggle, and they want to persevere. So all of this may be difficult at times, but it's an effort that the baby wants to take a part in, an active participant in what they're learning. And Arnold Gazelle, who was a child development expert, wrote a book in 1940 <laughs> called The First Years of Life. And I just want to read you a quote from this, because it's really good. He says, the process of back to side to belly and back is lengthy and involved. And it's the first motor process in which the child is an active agent. So it's the first process in which the baby really gets to take action. And the baby can feel good about himself for taking action and accomplishing something. We think of the physical and the cognitive and emotional stakes as being high. Babies involved in this. And if you've worked with babies, you know sometimes they're sad about it. It's difficult. They cry. They struggle. They get upset. They calm down again. It's really very involved for the baby. 
And when we put a baby into a position that they can't get into on their own, so in this case, prone positioning or placing a baby onto their belly, what we do is we're taking this being that's very active and very interested and we're putting them into a position, and I think you saw it, of helplessness. That baby was struggling and he was helpless. He was in there but he couldn't get out. He was moving, he was making all kinds of noise. It was very difficult for him. So we put that baby into a passive position that he's trapped in. And we're also saying, my plan for you is more important than yours. I want you to have tummy time now. You can't get into it on your own. You can't get out of it on your own. But I believe that this is what you should be doing right now. And I, I would think, as parents and caregivers, that sometimes we have to do those things. They've got to get injections sometimes. and interventions and sometimes you have to go to bed and you know you can't go under the cupboard and eat the cleaning supplies. We do things a lot that say my desire right now is more important than yours but let's make it really things that are important and valid. Research shows that typically we assess for movements um, potentially to see if there's delays so that we can recommend interventions. Interventions are very very important. There's a lot of interventions that where it really is true that the sooner you catch them, the earlier things are remediated and those babies, a lot of their issues can be resolved, especially when you're talking about basic things like screening for hearing or for vision. The sooner you catch those things, um, the better it is for the child's trajectory. One of these scales that we look at, so I'm not saying we shouldn't be measuring babies' milestones. Milestones are important. There's one that's really commonly used called the AIMS, A-I-M-S. And this study looked at six-month-old babies and how quickly they attained certain milestones. All of these babies were put on their backs. And they asked the parents, how often do you put your baby into tummy time? And they grouped the parents into two groups. One of the groups said rarely, and the other one said frequently or sometimes. And then what they did was they compared the development of the two groups. And what they found was that 94% of the babies that were frequently or sometimes put on their tummies to play were in the average scale for reaching milestones. 64% of the babies that were rarely put in tummy time were in the average category. So you can see where when you see research like this, what would you say is better? I mean, who would? Everybody wants a 94 rather than 63, right? You would say faster is better. But what we're looking at, and again, this is really where I think we need to be critical consumers of research. You really have to look at it and say, is faster always better? What are some other things that you may want to look at? Um, were the babies happy? Did the babies play well? Was the baby's movement strong? was the baby learning at their own pace? And you also want to look at, OK, at six months, this group may have been not as fast as the other one, but where were they at at nine months? Where were they at at two years? And they've actually found, when they were looking at these studies, that by two years old, the differences had disappeared. And so you may see this little faster jump ahead at one point, but by the time it came to walking, they were all reaching their milestones at the same time. Um, something else that's interesting, there's a researcher called Adele Diamond that's written a lot, of, um, a lot of articles on infant development and how babies learn. And they took some movement, I can't remember what it was, it may have been rolling over, it may have been, I don't know, picking something up. And she basically had two groups, one of them were coached and the other ones were not. So one of them had an adult that was like, like you heard in the video, come on baby, you can do it, good job, good job, you know, trying to help them to attain that milestone, and the other group just let the babies play. And there is, research shows, that you can get a faster development or a jump in development with coaching. It's a two week on average window. For what? And again, so I think we have to be really careful when we look at this and we say, okay, so these babies learned it, two weeks sooner, what was the price for that? 
What was the mood at home? What's the baby's attitude like? Are the parents happy with this? Did it cause stress? And again, for two weeks, I don't know. Another study that I looked at looked at four-month-old infants that were in tummy time. All of these babies spent more time on their backs when they were awake. So four-month-old babies, most of them spent more time awake on their backs than they did on their bellies. And so the researchers asked the parents why, because they knew what the recommendation was. And the parents said it was the infant's discomfort <laughs> They kept them from having the babies on their bellies. So it was difficult for them to do something for their baby that caused their child discomfort. And again, this is one of those things where I think I would just ask myself, is it really worth it? Sometimes it is. Sometimes you have to squelch your maternal instinct to do what's best. I don't know if this is one of them. To me, it seems like for that, you have parents that are listening to their babies, that are reading their cues, that are saying, this is hard for you, and I see that you're not ready for it. And should we be supporting those parents in doing that? I, I think we should. Now, these babies, these four months old in this study, again, showed a slight, um, they attained their milestones slightly sooner than the ones that didn't have the tummy time. For example, these babies reached milestones a little bit faster, such as putting their hands on their knees. So when they were playing on their backs, they placed their hands on their knees sooner. They went from their back to rolling onto their bellies without rotating, so they quickly flipped onto their bellies faster. And these babies were able to be propped into a sitting position with an adult holding their arms stiffly. So, <laughs> but, but, by eight and a half months, all advances for the tummy time babies had disappeared. So by eight and a half months, all of these babies that were looked at when they were four months old had rolled onto their bellies. So again, we're talking about a slight advance where we have to look at what's that really for? Because the fact is, they get there when they're ready. And I want to finish up with one more um, quote from the German researcher who says, parents and other persons engaged in childcare attempt repeatedly to promote developmental phases by active manipulation and verbal stimulation. So parents and caregivers are constantly coaching the children onto the next step. He says, this may, however, among other things, cause an unnatural acceleration of certain movement sequences, as well as a retardation of highly important fine motor abilities. The consequences are stress and insecurities, as pointed out by the Hungarian pediatrician, Emmy Pickler. And so not only is he saying you, get a, you may be getting a slight advance, but he's saying that it causes stress, and he says, that by promoting and pushing in one area, you may be losing development in another. And so I think as educators, we have to be careful of simplistic causation. So by saying, for example, putting babies to sleep on their back causes gross motor delays. We have to watch for assumptions such as a two-week window or a two-week jump is better or things like 94% reached this milestone a few weeks earlier and 64 didn't, then thinking that that necessarily means better. So being careful that we don't think that faster is always better. One thing that was interesting about the studies is they all talked about the lack of tummy time. So they used wording like prone positioning was limited or the baby had lack of experience in tummy time, or the baby was never placed in tummy time to play. But these same researchers, so you can find it in the same study, say that positioning may overshadow, so in our zeal to do tummy time, we may be overshadowing other important connections. One of them, his last name is Pin, P-I-N, he actually writes in his paper on tummy time, 
one may argue that changing the position of the infant is better than not doing it at all. However, supporting and stimulating environment, including human interaction and stimulation, may be more effective in promoting motor development of the infant. So, <laughs> I know it's good, isn't it? Basically, he's saying, you might think it's better to move the baby than not move the baby, but what might be best is actually interacting with the baby <laughs> and creating a stimulating environment. And this was the researcher that wrote the definitive paper on tummy time. Um, another one, and again, the reason that this is important is because you know, we look at the milestones because we want to be careful of delays. And if there are delays, we want to do interventions. And they're saying you need to be careful of that, too, of then having all of these babies where you're suddenly saying they're delayed, they need interventions. Interventions, timely interventions properly applied are, are priceless. But he says here, pediatricians who provide well baby care should understand and appreciate the limits of what's considered typical development so as not to make inappropriate referrals. And again, the development occurs on a spectrum. It's not a little tiny box that you're either in or out of. It's a spectrum there. And he's saying look at the whole spectrum and really know your child development. And he says therapists who get babies referred to them should understand the phenomenon, basically the phenomenon of development being on a spectrum so as not to misidentify children for intervention. So the implication is that if you're offering interventions based on milestones and tummy time, that you do that cautiously. Let me see if there was anything else. Um, I think I, I'm going to focus on this a little, little later, but we talked about, um, I also want to mention intrinsic motivation being, I talked about how when the babies are moving and learning, that's baby's desire to do it. It's not the parents' as baby really wants to struggle and learn. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my feeling on this, the whole um, movement thing is that um, because babies aren't sleeping well, they're put in apparatuses to sleep a lot of times, either a car seat or a swing where they can't move while they're sleeping. So they learn to sleep in, in the same position, which contributes to yes. the flat head. Um, but I'm also wondering if in your research if you found that that intrinsic motivation is lost after a certain stage because we've discovered that in our center. If they haven't been allowed to roll over by like say six months, they lose that desire mm -hmm. and they're content to be on their back. Mm -hmm. And then we really do have to work with mm -hmm. them on learning to roll over. Have you found that yeah. that's the case? Well, I th you know, I. Th I think that you make a really good point, which is, and which is, and you can see that with the newborn babies, there's things that could and should be happening at a certain point at any time we intervene in. And I would call keeping a baby in a swing while they're sleeping certainly a physical intervention. I mean, that baby's not free to move. So whenever you do that, you're changing the trajectory of the development. And could somebody, you know, could you have learned helplessness develop from a situation like that? Certainly you can, absolutely. Do you find that they lose that motivation after a certain point? Well, and that they do need I, I mean, I, I think what you're saying is that they're learning helplessness. Right. And yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That was a great point. So I'm going to move on to the DP. The research on that was just a little trickier for me because typically it's more medically oriented and also more um, occupational therapists than nurses tend to write a lot more about this. Um, there is an increase in this since the 1990s. There's no doubt about it. So that is true. The thing that we want to look at is the single-minded association of back to sleep equals DP. If your baby's placed on their backs to sleep, your babies could have a flat head. And so in order to prevent that, they have to play on their bellies. So one of the researchers who wrote one of these articles said, Sup um, back sleep or supine sleeping position is not the only contributing factor. And urges people to look at the increasing time, just like you said, 
that infants spend in car seats, swings, boppies, and bouncy seats. So yes, absolutely. Looking at the studies, I found that a flathead at birth, so if you know, it had to do with your baby's placement in utero, um, a flathead at birth was not associated with having a flattened area at four months. So most of this stuff tends to resolve on its own. And the author of that study that showed that there wasn't a clean causal connection between the two felt that it's better to advise all parents to give their babies unrestricted movement rather than try to single out groups that might be at risk for having flat heads. So rather than focusing on babies that sleep on their backs or babies that don't do tummy time, his recommendation is let's tell all parents to keep their babies out of restrictive advices, uh, devices and let them move more, more on their own. There is European research, not American, um, that points to some disadvantages of tummy time where they actually looked at, in this case it was preemies, so premature babies that were, having, that were being placed in tummy time. And the author of this one writes, the preterm baby is subject to the force of gravity when its body lies pressed against the mattress on which it's placed. So for a full term baby that has better muscle tone, you can see that they're really able to very quickly use that surface to move off of. But a preterm baby feels its body weight much more strongly and it doesn't have the strong muscle tone to really react with it. And you can see their movements are very jerky. He found significant abnormalities in the group of preterm babies that was placed routinely in tummy time. They found muscle shortening, so there were some muscles that were abnormally tight. Hyperabduction, which is movements that were not in the normal range, where like babies would reach very far back abnormally rather than just what we consider a normal range and rigid muscles, so some muscles in their body that they would hold very, very tightly. What's really happening in tummy time? Now we've watched three short little clips and everyone's had the same message that it's difficult for the baby, um, the parents seem very active, maybe a little stressed out in what's happening. Um, we talked about maybe lack of some eye contact there between parent and for the baby. So what happens when you place a baby in tummy time? You know, why don't they just lay there and relax? The reason that they don't is because they can't. And the reason that they can't is because there's what we call primitive newborn reflexes that are stimulated when you place the baby on a surface face down. There's a, a researcher called Suzanne Colson that has written a lot about this. Um, she has a couple of key points one of them, so primitive newborn reflexes are inborn responses. They're not learned. They're behaviors and reactions to outside stimuli in this case. The original research shows that there are about 50 primitive newborn um, reflexes, and all of these tend to phase out somewhere between a month and three months. That the reflexes that you see, so this little baby versus one of the earlier ones that we saw, that the reflexes will vary with the way they're expressed based on the baby's gestational age, so whether they were born full term or early. The neonatal position, so the positions that babies are in, affect the reflexes. So face down, you're getting a lot of the reflexes. If you hold babies upright on a diagonal, it all depends on which reflexes are then shown. That the rooting reflex, which is one that most people are familiar with, we think of that as the one where baby's searching for food, that that reflex includes head turning, so back and forth, cheek stimulation, lip stimulation, chin stimulation, hand to mouth is another feeding reflex. Babies do it in utero, so it starts really early. And then stepping and crawling are also part of the feeding reflexes. And you stimulate all of those when you put the baby into tummy time. Mm -hmm. When you, you, you stimulate those reflexes when you're placing a baby into tummy time. 
So, and I'll, I'll show you some video of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the reflexes are defensive. There's one um, recent article that they talk about the newly discovered elbowing reflex. This is for real, though. So they find that if you press on the ribs of a baby, so pressure on the subcostal region will cause them to elbow. And it's like a protective kind of moving their arms thing. Um, by the time they're about 30 days old, that goes away. Some are protective, such as the ones where the grasp reflex, you know, where they'll grasp onto something, um, helps them to stay close to mom. The reflexes don't allow any variation. A reflex is a reflex. So if you elicit it, and if you ever played with newborns and you tie, you know, they'll go like this, and then you can put your hand here, and they'll do that for a really long time. They can't help it. So when you stimulate it, they're going to react to it. Um, if a baby is in a relaxed position, the unintentional movements will work for them. But if a baby is in a stressed position, then they're just stressful. So that's what we were seeing. Stressful situations where the reflexes are not helping baby. They're just making baby work his body over and over again. Now, they all typically disappear in the first three months of life. Some researchers feel they disappear, and others feel that babies keep using the reflexes, but they build them into intentional movements. What I think is interesting here is that, for example, with the elbowing defense that's stimulated by pressure here, that disappears at around the same time where a baby who's placed on his back will be naturally starting to roll onto a side and perhaps every now and then overshooting and ending up on his belly. So isn't it a wonderful plan that nature has for us that the reflexes subside at just the time where the baby's movements become intentional to start doing them? I just want to follow that up with a quote from a 1962 article. They say, the capacity of the neonate or the newborn for infant mother behavior in child care tasks such as feeding is of unusual interest. The feeding task is a process which requires coordination of the mother's actions with her baby's reflex responses. It offers the newborn varied stimulation which he can sense and which he can respond to by reflexes. In the first four days of life, it may be the infant's only opportunity for action. So we go back to that babies in control, babies in action, which can release maternal responses in the social environment which he and his mother offer each other. So the recommendations for tummy time, we've already talked about, they're very widespread. We have a program in Tampa that's called Safe Baby. And what they do there is they, um, it's delivered in all of the hospitals and they talk to new families about choosing your caregiver, placing baby back to sleep, no smoking in the home, the soft, the all soft items out of the bed. But then in it, they do say, put newborns on their bellies in order to give them some playtime and practice. So that kind of recommendation is really, really common now. Wait, mm -hmm. I find the word playtime an interesting persuasion by the powers that be. And as a mom, you're so vulnerable. Even when you know better, you don't know better. So I find that word suspect. It doesn't feel very um, with much integrity. And you know, I find it interesting that you say that, too, because that earlier quote, even the researchers that wrote the papers on tummy time say that it's probably best to have human interaction and stimulation. So again, that's the relationships we're building at the beginning. So I want to finish up before I make some rec recommendations. So it has been shown that back to sleep or supine sleep does reduce the incidence of, incidence of SIDS and SUIDS. 
research does not prove from everything that I've looked at that placing newborns and young infants on their bellies before they can do it on their own prevents developmental delays or speeds development significantly into the preschool years, nor does research show that placing babies in tummy time will prevent or mediate the DP or the flattened head in any way. So what I propose is that our focus moves to allowing infants more opportunities to move freely and on their own and less time in restrictive devices, both for the purpose of sound motor development and uh, DP. So how do we talk to the parents and the caregivers that are with our babies? How do you talk to in the workshop before you I had someone come up and say, I have to do tummy time every day. It's in their plan. She doesn't have a choice about it. So, you know, it's a process. I think if we move towards strength-based thinking versus trying to solve problems, what can we do? When is baby in tummy time? Baby is in tummy time naturally when mom or dad or when you're holding them skin to skin or when you're holding them on your chest. If you're leaning back, baby's on their tummies. Do they move their heads and necks? Yeah, they do when you hold them like that. That might be good. If, you're, if the parent is concerned that because they're not in tummy time, their development will be delayed, you could look at, you know, development is it's, it's layered. It's not little boxes. So and everything builds on the previous movement. So you may think about, well, what comes before rolling over onto your belly? laying on your side or being comfortable on your back? What can we do to support the play environment? Maybe we can use a firm surface. Maybe we can put some simple toys and place them around baby. Maybe we can have floor time every day at a predictable time. You know, those are all things that we can do and that we can suggest where different parties' needs will still be met. So sometimes you just have to find a way to make things work. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think I've left you with all the answers, but I hope I've got you thinking. And again, there's a lot of research out there, and I think it's important for all of us to be role models for critical thinkers, where people make recommendations that put our children or our parents into situations of discomfort that we really question that, and that we help them question it too. There should be an open dialogue about all things that have to do with raising our babies. So thank you so much. And if you guys have any questions now, that'd be fine. Thank you.